Got your Bible, meet me in the book of Luke, chapter 4 and verse 16. And yes, I said 6.30 p.m. We're going to gather at 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday, uh, this Tuesday, Election Day. Luke, chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. And when you get there, just shout amen. I know we're together. And if you're there at home, just type in amen, and I'll know that we are together in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And would you take a moment to do what has become our practice and just invite two or three people to join us now as we get ready to dive into the Word of God. And uh, we are about to learn what it means for us to make some good trouble. And I would love for you to invite some people that may not be of the same view, may not be of the same hue, uh, or people that may not yet be a part of God's kingdom, or people that may be far from God. Would you take a moment and love your neighbor uh, by just sharing this link on your wall or tagging somebody in the comments and inviting them to join us? Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. This morning, I want to preach on the topic of good trouble, good news to the poor, good news to the poor. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Some might read this text, and as they came out of reading this text, some might conclude and even invite and share others and say, we must go to marginalized communities. We must go to places where people are living in poverty and preach the gospel and see the poor get saved because we have been called to preach the gospel to the poor. And they would be right to do that. It would be biblical for them to do that. Others might read this text and emphasize the fact that the poor are any and all who don't know Jesus for the pardoning and atoning of their sins. Others might read this and say that all need to hear the gospel. And they would be right and biblical and true in saying that. Truly, there's no deeper poverty than to be spiritually indebted. There, There is no deeper poverty that a human being can and will ever experience than being responsible for the price of their sins, past, present, and the ones that we are yet to commit. There's no greater indebtedness that we as human beings, as a people, can experience than spiritual poverty. None of us can work. None of us can earn. None of us can borrow. None of us can barter. None of us can bargain our way out of the debt that we have, which is the debt of sin, that we are separated from God and his ways and the acts that we have committed in that separation trying to find joy, peace, and contentment and fulfillment for ourselves, trying to make ourselves happy. We have brought a load of sin on ourselves. And if we're honest, even as I read today, some of us are still committed to sin because we don't feel we can find fulfillment and contentment in Jesus and Jesus alone. The Bible even says in Romans chapter 3, And verse 23, for all, how many is all? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 says, and the wages of sin 
is death. It's not talking about one-time death. It's talking about eternal death. For the wages of sin is eternal death, eternal separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Poverty and spiritual poverty is the most significant poverty that a human being could ever experience. But if our gospel stops with the preaching of only the vertical reconciliation of men, women, children, and humanity to God by the death burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, if our, if our gospel that we preach only has that one dimension to it, it is not the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. The Jesus Christ gospel, the gospel that Jesus preached was a gospel that had two dimensions to it. It had a vertical dimension of us being reconciled to God by his spilled blood, by his payment on the cross, by his resurrection, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he invites us to believe in him and for us to have all of our sins pardoned and atoned for, forgotten and thrown away from us as far as the east is from the west. But Jesus also, every time he preached and was asked about eternal life or his gospel, also talked about a horizontal dimension to his gospel. You might remember that the young lawyer approached Jesus after seeing Jesus confuse the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he thought to himself and with the group that he was with that he had a way to confuse Jesus. And he comes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? He was speaking of Moses' law and he wanted Jesus to pull from that law and share with them what was the greatest commandment. And Jesus said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. But that was just the vertical element. Then Jesus added a horizontal to it. And he said, and the second is like unto it. That we would love our neighbor as ourselves. He said that all of the law and all of the prophets hangs on these two. Every time Jesus preached the gospel, he never stopped by preaching a gospel that was simply vertical in its direction. He always added a horizontal element. And if we preach another gospel, we're not preaching the same gospel that Jesus preached. When the rich, young ruler came to ask Jesus, good master, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? expecting Jesus to give him an answer that only dealt with his vertical reconciliation to God. And Jesus begins by walking him through elements of the Mosaic law to which the young man says, all of these have I kept from my youth up. But then Jesus, as he always did, as you watch him preaching and teaching and demonstrating the gospel throughout the New Testament, he adds in this horizontal element by saying to the man, but there's one thing you lack. Go and take all that you have and distribute it to the poor. Jesus always added a horizontal element because his vertical uh, was not enough. There was a vertical element to the gospel. But if all our gospel does is sends us to heaven and makes no impact in the world, then it is not the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. It's not enough for us to say we shouldn't talk about those things. We don't need to bring those things up. The only important thing is that a person receives Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We can preach that, but it's a half gospel that we've done violence to because it's not the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. The gospel that Jesus preached was a gospel that had vertical and horizontal rightness to it. It had vertical and horizontal implications to it. Jesus preached a multidimensional gospel. And the next time some author writes a book or some preacher preaches a sermon or some follower of Jesus argues with you that you've fallen into the social gospel, Remind them that the gospel has always had two dimensions, that the gospel that Jesus preached, yes, when he talked about the poor, he was talking about the spiritually poor. But when he talked about the poor, Jesus, as was his way of preaching the gospel, was also talking about the economically disadvantaged. 
If you preach one without the other, you have not preached the whole gospel. Meet me back in Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Although not explicitly stated, there's an urgency here in this text. I just want to say it again. Although it's not explicitly stated, you know how an author can write and an author can write in a way that the things that are not explicitly said, but they are inferred. And there's something inferred in this text and that thing that is inferred in this text is that there is an urgency here. This is Jesus who has just come from being baptized in the Jordan waters by John. This is Jesus that immediately after having the Holy Spirit descend upon him and the father proclaim that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Take note that he hadn't done anything. He hadn't preached anything. But the father's pleasure is in us because we are his children. And the father declares his pleasure. But immediately Jesus goes led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. And in going into the wilderness, he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. And as he's fasting and praying, he goes there and he is tempted by the devil. And then I see an urgency implied in this text because the first thing he does that on Sabbath day, he goes and does what he always did. And he goes into the congregation in the synagogue and he makes this declaration that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. If our gospel only has one dimension and we would think that Jesus is only talking about I came to get you saved because I am the Messiah, then we don't understand the gospel that Jesus preached. He chose Nazareth, a poor working class town that was mixed with Jew and Gentile living there. It's interesting that Jesus wasn't born in an elite zip code. Jesus is born in a zip code where poverty is the norm, and he comes back to his hometown, the place that he was sent to, as was his tradition, and begins his earthly ministry there with the declaration that I am anointed. What are you anointed for, Jesus? I am anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. And if Jesus was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor, his body is also anointed. To preach the gospel to the poor. Too often we we lose or surrender or simply live without the urgency that I see. The sense of urgency and the sense of being sent that I see in this text. The truth of the matter is the kingdom of God is within us if we are the church and we have been sent to live and be a proclamation of that gospel wherever we go, and more specifically, where we have been sent. I don't know if you know it, but here we are living in the greater Philadelphia region. And the greater Philadelphia region, Philadelphia as a city, is the poorest big city in the whole country. Philadelphia, the place that you've been sent to, is the poorest city in all of the big cities in the country. Philadelphia is the poorest. Among all cities, not counting their size, Camden is constantly ranked among the top three or four poorest cities in the country. It's had times when it's been one or two. And somehow God, as he, just like he sent Jesus to Nazareth to begin his ministry, look where he sent us to. 
Is the church good news to the poor in this region? Do we preach the gospel to the poor in this reason? Is our preaching just vertical or is there a vertical and a horizontal preaching that comes from the church, that comes from our lives in this region? Look where he's placed and planted us. Eva Gladstein, the deputy director of the Philadelphia Health and Human Services, and I quote, she says, the single biggest predictor for how a child will do in life in this region is the zip code in which they are born. When I read that, I read that as an indictment against the church in this region. This woman who works for the Philadelphia Department of Health and Human Services says that the biggest predictor for a child in this region is not whether they come to faith in Jesus and become a part of a church that works out the gospel vertically and horizontally. I've seen the lives of so many change. No, Eva Gladstein, who has a clear view of this region, says of this region, I can tell you how a child will turn out. Tell me the zip code they were born in. And the church in this region is so anemic and so unaware of her job, I can tell you, and, and I've done some studying, 70% of us will die in the same economic bracket that we were born in. Seven out of ten. In, in the place where the American dream is supposed to happen, there's very little mobility socially and economically in this country. We're going to dig into how and why that could be, but the first thing we've got to hear is that if the church is responsible vertically and horizontally, we've been anointed to preach the gospel to the poor, then there's work that the anointing is on us to do that we haven't let learned how to do and have not yet stepped into doing it. What if some of our fulfillment, what if some of our joy, what if the purpose that we're always longing and looking for God revealed to me my purpose? What if so much of it was locked up in us just realizing that we have been anointed to preach the gospel vertically and horizontally to the poor, that God has anointed us, the body of Jesus Christ, to make Eva Gladstein have to retract her quote and say something different? you think about the Philadelphia region, I, I can't help but remember Allen Iverson in his heyday. A little, tiny, skinny, scrawny guard who didn't play the position the way the position was supposed to be played. And our city loved him. He took us all the way to Los Angeles where we lost against the Lakers. But I'll never forget when he shot that shot and stepped over the other player like that. If you watch basketball, you know what I'm talking about because that image meant so much to those in the greater Philadelphia region. If you watch me, I wear a Rocky t-shirt every now and then. I've got two of them, so don't think I wear it all the time. I brought two of them. But I love it because Rocky represents the gritty underdog, just like Alvin I Allen Iverson does, the gritty, underdog, independent, rebel spirit of this region, that no matter what is in front of us, even though you expect less of us, somehow we figure out how to overcome it, and that is the persona of this region. No matter where I travel in the United States, when I say that I'm from Philly, people have a certain expectation of a person from Philly. Can anybody else bear witness to that? But there's an ugly underbelly to the fierce, independent, gritty, underdog persona that characterizes this area. This area also is tribal, territorial, classist, racist, and that underbelly is there underneath us disfiguring people and communities. Could it be that the reason that our friend and brother Walter is dead today because when he called 911, when they saw what zip code he was calling from, they already were convinced in their minds what type of action would be needed to be taken in that area. I'm still stuck on the idea that zip code tells us more about people than it should because the church has not yet understood her role and responsibility, which is why on Tuesday we're coming to pray because I'm tired of us looking to vote someone in office that can remove the poverty and inequity that exists in society when Jesus declares that I am anointed. To preach the gospel to the poor and the gospel has vertical implications where we need to be reconciled 
once and for all and progressively to Jesus Christ, but we also need to be reconciled horizontally. Jesus never spoke of a gospel that did not also impact the ills that existed in society. Too often the church has been pushed into the corner just to preach and sing, but to do nothing. That's why generations have left us. That's why the young that desire and burn to see change and have the I want to do something kind of attitude don't want to hang out with the church anymore because she just seems to be complacent and complicit with what we see going on in society. But the church of Jesus and the church that Jesus envisioned would never have been known for that. She knows that she is anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. You might say, well, well, well what, what, what does that look like? What, what was that, that, that feel like, Pastor? It starts with the idea that we understand that we've been sent. It starts with the idea that we understand that we've been anointed. It starts with the idea that we understand that there is urgency. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, He said to them, pray like this, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There was an implied urgency that when the kingdom came, that the kingdom would work to make the earth look like heaven. And guess who are the carriers and the stewards of the kingdom of God right now? You, me, us, the church. So no matter if a Democrat gets in office or a Republican gets in office, we won't be able to stand before Jesus and say, yeah, I voted every year. I was active in the democratic process. I prayed about who to elect into office, and I put them in the office. But he's going to ask us, but what did you do? Did you fulfill your calling of preaching to the poor? Before this feels like too much pressure, let me paint what it looks like, and then let me remind you that we have been anointed. Jesus didn't get up and say, I'm determined. He got up and said, I'm anointed. (laughs) Jesus didn't get up and say, I made up my mind. Jesus said, I've been anointed. Jesus didn't say, I know how to do it. I've got the ability. I went to school. I'm educated for it. No, Jesus said, I have been anointed. And church, as we established last week, we are his body and we have been anointed. The problem is, is that we so often wrongly apply the anointing, thinking that the anointing is for some selfish endeavor. Not realizing that the anointing is for some cosmic endeavor. That we are the ones that have been called to usher in a transformation with urgency. Meet me at Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And stood up to read, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Would you say that with me? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. No, all of us together at home and in person. Would you say this with me? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. To preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. We are anointed for good trouble. It's going to be good trouble because the gospel, as I said last week, every time it comes, it overturns the status quo. The gospel has always been the enemy to the status quo, and it always will be. It's an enemy to the current state of affairs. Because we live in a place that has not been shaped and conformed to his image and his likeness. It's a place that has been shaped and conformed to carnal and fleshly. And competitive and anti-Christ and anti-human ways. And we are here to usher in the kingdom of God. 
I'm so glad you asked me, Pastor, what does it look like to preach the gospel to the poor horizontally? I know what it looks like vertically. My church has always taught me that. How many of you learn how to share your faith with other people? How many of you learn how to share the four spiritual laws or, or you learn how to pray the prayer of salvation with people? How many just wave at me at home and online? If you did at home, uh, just, just put a hand in front of me that, yeah, I, I, I learned how to preach the gospel vertically. But how many of us have ever learned how to preach the gospel horizontally? How many of us have, have ever learned what it really looks like when I pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, that I should also have an expectation that the Holy Spirit will begin to open my eyes and put demands on me to use my gifts, talents, resources, and abilities in ways that I had not intended to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And to use my gifts, talents, as resources, and abilities to see horizontal preaching of the gospel. To preach the gospel horizontally, I'm just looking at the text here because it's screaming out to me. I pray when you read it this week, it screams out to you. But it looks like calling out and challenging unjust economic practices. Calling them out and challenging them and pointing to them and bringing attention to ways and practices and habits and laws that, that disadvantage some while advantaging others. It looks like recognizing that there are certain practices and policies and habits in place that oppress some zip codes while uplifting and inviting in other zip codes. It's asking God to anoint me so that when I'm at work in the place that I work in the spaces that I have my vocation that I can see practices and policies that marginalize some and habits and ways it's the way we've always done it but don't include others. This is what it looks like for horizontal preaching of the gospel to happen and come through us as the church. Amen. Economic injustice has devastating effects on our region. The protesting that is going on now uh, is not only done because of the murders that we've seen in the streets at the hands of those that we pay with our taxes. But some of the uproar and the uprising is also done because of the deep hopelessness that is in people. The deep sense of being stuck and that things won't change and things won't move. I'm so glad that our church is intergenerational because the, the more chronologically superior members of my church always remind me as a young man that, no, Pastor Kevin, things have moved and changed a lot. But when I look now, I see things needing to move and change a lot more. And now my generation, our generation, your generation is called to keep moving the proverbial ball of equity and justice and inclusion up the street. Not because it's a human issue or even a sociological issue, although it is. It's a theological issue. It's a gospel issue. This is not something that we made up our mind to do because it would be good. It's something that Jesus has anointed us to do. Just some statistics that show how much work that we have to do as the church. In this region where we live, the average net worth of an African-American household or family is about $17,000. 17, the average net worth of an Anglo or a white family in the very same region is about $171,000. In fact, this number holds firm throughout the country. The only reason that Philadelphia is considered the poorest of the big cities is because our poverty is so deep. But when you look on the surface numbers, we see that same gap. About 17,000 is the average net worth for an African-American family, where 171,000, more than 10 times, is the average net worth of a white or Anglo family. You might say, well, how can that be? Well, one of the primary ways that it is is because of home ownership. Largely, there's the biggest disparities between home ownership or one of the most visible ways to see that there won't be wealth to pass on, and the wealth gap is largely in the area of home ownership. You might say, why are you preaching about this? Because we need to be able to see 
where poverty has entrenched itself and then ask God how he's called us uniquely as the church to be a part of moving the disparity gap because where the disparity gap happens, if the church doesn't do something, then people in their flesh will try to do something. And we are the ones anointed for this. Are you tracking with me? There are 21 black-owned banks in our country. 21. They have approximately $5 billion in assets. I don't even know how many Anglo-owned or led banks there are, but what I do know is that they have more than a trillion dollars in assets. For the African-American-led churches, 65% of their uh, resources they use to make loans to people of color in business and for individuals for mortgages. For those Anglo-owned banks, 1% of their assets are used to be loaned to African-American-owned businesses and loaned to African-Americans hoping to move into home ownership. I'm not preaching about racism. I'm preaching about poverty. I'm not even preaching about racism. I'm preaching about caste, where certain value is assigned to certain hues and views and certain value is assigned to other hues and views. I want you to understand that the disparities do not exist because of intellect, the disparities do not exist because of effort and will and laziness. The disparities do not exist even because of a lack of desire or a lack of intent. The, these disparities primarily exist, if I could just put it out there first, is because of unjust practices, policies, and laws that the church has yet to confront. I'm just saying that the church has yet to confront. We can't elect somebody in office to do what the church primarily is responsible to do. And I know right now you're saying, Pastor, well, I don't know how to do that. I don't understand it. It starts with awareness. If our eyes are open and we become aware, then Jesus can start to organize and arrange us in ways that we can preach the gospel as we've been called to preach the gospel. And don't hear me preaching black supremacy. Don't hear me preaching white supremacy. Hear me preaching Christ supremacy. Christ supremacy brings us to the place that we literally become siblings, that we live as brothers and sisters. And any e economist worth his or her weight in gold will tell you that in an economy or in a society where there is equity, those are the societies that can experience the highest levels of flourishing. You might remember earlier in the year when the Lord took us through scarcity and generosity. A scarcity mindset says if they get more, then I'll have less. But a generosity mindset understands that if they get more, we get more, we all get more because flourishing comes out of societies that have equity in them. If the United States of America wants to live up to her ideals, the church is going to have to help her do it. Are you ready for this? Because this is going to cause good trouble in our country. This is going to cause good trouble on our jobs. This is going to cause good trouble in our communities. This is even going to cause good trouble in our lives. For us to, to, to take the advantage that has been given to us and use our advantage to advantage and include others. Is this not what Jesus did in Philippians chapter 2? Who being equal with God, thought it not robbery. He was equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. He, he, took, he took the advantage that God the Father had given him and left heaven, put on an earthly suit, and came down into this realm to use his advantage to vertically and horizontally reconcile our lives so that we would be called the sons and daughters of God. He was the only begotten son, but he did not see himself losing anything to welcome other sons and daughters to the table. He was not content to be an only child. He wanted to have a family of siblings, and then he doesn't seat us in a lesser seat. He seats us right at his right hand. Come on now, see our God. Poverty 
and disparity are largely the result of the church not understanding who she's been called to be. Poverty and disparity are largely the result of the church not understanding what she is anointed to do. As a close, I just want to read an excerpt from a letter from a Birmingham jail. This was written by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King as he sat in a jail cell in the city of Birmingham, Alabama. He wrote this letter in April of 1963. And this 7,000-letter he a uh, 7,000 word letter that he wrote was in response to the church in that community. When he came to Birmingham, seven pastors and a rabbi wrote a letter to him that was publicly published. And the letter basically said that he was a troublemaker for having come to Birmingham. Said that he had come as an outside agitator to stir up trouble. But in reality, Reverend Dr. King was coming there to be the church to usher in the kingdom of God because in Birmingham, the laws of segregation, which made one human being seem more valuable than the other, which disadvantaged one while advantaging the other, he came to preach the gospel to the poor in that place, vertically and horizontally. And when he came preaching the gospel there, it was, an, it was an offense to the status quo of that day. The challenge is, is that the church was one of the ones fighting for the status quo more than any other. And to those faith leaders, quote, unquote, I pulled this paragraph from Dr. King's spirit-inspired writing. There was a time when the church was very powerful. Would you stand to your feet as I read this at home and in person, would you stand as I read this? There was a time when the church was very powerful. In the time when the early Christians rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the norms of society. Whenever the early Christians entered a town, the people in power became disturbed and immediately sought to convict the Christians for being disturbers of the peace and outside agitators. But the Christians pressed on in the conviction that they were a colony of heaven, called to obey God, rather than man. Small in number they were, but big in commitment. They were too God intoxicated to be astronomically intimidated. By their effort and example, by their effort and example, by their effort and example, they brought an end to such ancient evils as infanticide, the killing of babies, and gladiatorial contests where they took people that were largely poor and for sport allowed them to fight lions in open contests for people to celebrate and watch. But things are different now. So often the contemporary church is a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. So often it is an arch defender for the status quo. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is consoled by the church's silence and often even a vocal sanction of things as they are. God has anointed us to preach the gospel to the poor. God is empowering us to be salt and light in this world. Salt because we preserve the true essence of who the church is. We don't let her decay and rot and forget who she was created to be. So we are the salt of the world, the true ecclesia, the true called out ones. But we're also the salt because we're here to preserve societies, to help preserve people groups, and to help bring flourishing and equity and inclusion everywhere we go.